when it's easier to get South African Krugerrands or uh, Austrian Philharmonics than it is U.S. Eagles for the public, something is really wrong. Welcome to Gold Silver Pros. Searching for the best precious metals deal? Shop with our trusted partner, Arc Silver. Access special deals on silver, gold, and platinum through our website, or call 307-264-9441. Hey everybody, this is Rob Gaines of goldsilverpros.com. It is November 9th, 2022. Just had my birthday a few days ago, a year older or a year younger, depending on how you do it. I like to count backwards now that I'm getting close to 50. Uh, joined by a, a group of really good friends. Uh, really privileged to be able to call these people friends, have a lot of respect for them and why I invited them to do uh, the, the, I'm sorry, the round table today. And, but number one thing we want to do is talk about Silverfest because this comes about once every year. It is the silver party of the year for everybody in the industry. We always have so much fun and it's put on by my good friend, Chris Marcus of Arcadia Economics and his partner, Yara, as well. Chris, how are you doing today? Doing well. And again, happy birthday, Rob. Uh, I was happy to hear you had a nice night out the other night. And mm -hmm. um, so well wishes there and excited to have all of you as a part of Silverfest, which is coming up this Saturday, November 12th. It's going to be our third one uh, that we've done. <clears throat> and um, really just a place to talk about the things that are going on in the silver market. Obviously, this has not been the easiest year for some people watching the silver price. The Fed's been hiking rates a lot faster than anyone really expected. And in fact, I think back often to this time last year when I don't think most people would have expected the Fed would be hiking, let alone at the pace that they've gone at. So obviously that's had an impact in the market, although it has been interesting where we see the divergence between what's happening in the paper price and what's going on in the physical market, which obviously Andy can talk about plenty. But these are all the topics uh, we'll be talking about on Saturday. Uh, Rob, like you mentioned, we're fortunate to get to talk to a lot of really smart people who follow these markets every day, who have been doing that for decades. And that, along with giving the people who are watching at home a, a place to come and ask questions, there's also some virtual booths. So I know a lot of people often feel like they're the lone wolf in their town and like connecting with others who are seeing this same perspective on the world. So that's what we'll be digging into on Saturday at Silverfest 3 and excited to have all of you on board and participating in it. So Chris, um, what are we doing for the after hours? Are we meeting for drinks after or, or how does that go? <laughs> well, I, I hear you're down by the beach. So maybe we'll all come down to South Padre where Rob is. But yeah, after the last panel, which is our Ask the Experts segment, uh, we'll be having a happy hour in one of the booths. So again, not just that you have to sit uh, behind the screen and type questions all day, but certainly if you'd like to come on and meet some other people, talk with some of the speakers who are going to be there and just relax and celebrate that there are other people seeing these same things out there in the world that you are. And I know uh, for anyone who's been following the medals, it's not been the easiest journey when you see the the debt continue to expand, the central bank currency, uh, you know, printing amounts continue to expand and wonder when this is going to ever end, yet that's what we'll be talking about and celebrating and happy hour at the end. Yeah, and a lot of good points you bring up. I know at the conference, we'll speak about everything you've got, you know, the who's who of uh, line up there. Andy will be here. Everybody on the screen will be there offering their opinions. I wanted to set up this discussion here a little bit, and then we're going to turn to Andy, because I think everybody wants to know what the hell is going on with the physical market. To set this up, we've had raging physical demand. A lot of people have been saying, yeah, metal is actually coming off of COMEX now. It's coming off of London. The, the ETFs were bleeding there for a while, SOV, before we started to have some flow back in, because I think people are looking at SLV going, I need an investment. SLV is a good proxy. I can get it in my passive fund. I think people are actually coming back into it, even though it's not you're not going to get your physical there. But there's this divergence between whatever paper derivatives you want to pick and the physical demand. And Andy, you were on our show a while back talking about the billionaire who bought the 50 million, I think went after almost a million American Silver Eagles. Now we're looking, and, and, and apparently that was prescient timing by that person because apparently we're looking at American Eagles and the premiums have gotten stupid ridiculous. Um, I've had people tell me who I trust that... One of the reasons American Eagles are harder to produce now is Sunshine is selling into the retail market to get a better price. So all of their blanks and planchettes are not going 
to the mint anymore. Is that the main reason why the mint can't get American Eagle? Are there other reasons or from, from your viewpoint, what's going on with American Silver Eagle? I mean, the premium on that has just gotten stupid ridiculous, I think at this point. You know, Rob, if it were just that, if it were just the Silver Eagle, I would buy everything you just said to me. Yeah. But what's really strange about the U.S. Mint um, has more to do with gold than it does with silver. If we look since 2020, um, literally, I, I've had conversations with Chris about the on and offline, the amount of percentage, anyways, of sales that are done in silver since 2020 are north of 90, 95% easily for everybody. Um, and gold has been an afterthought by and large over the last two and a half years since COVID. And what was most startling to me about everything that is the inefficiency of the U.S. Mint is not the fact that literally since March of 2020, we've had these elevated premiums on Silver Eagles that have never come back. Whereas if you would have called me on Thanksgiving Day 2019 and said, hey, I want to buy a million dollars worth of Silver Eagles, I'd say, OK, Rob, three and a quarter over spot, mm -hmm. 265 back if you want over spot, if you want to sell them back to me on Christmas Day, I'd say, you know, you got about 75 cents spread. You call me back four months later in March and the bid on those is 11 bucks over and they've never come back down ever since. But they have swings of a dollar or two, but they have been elevated 100% of the time since COVID. Now, what is strange about things is that in all of 2020 and in all of 2021, the Gold Eagles stayed where they always were my whole career, where you could buy Gold Eagles at 4%, 4.5%, 5% over from a retailer like myself. But the Silver Eagles are now costing you $13, $14, $15 over spot. It's been that way forever for the last three years where things got really weird with the u.s mint now, i would have bought what you said about me the fact that the rumor is that the treasury department uh, would have to sign off on the ability for the u.s to pay higher premium for the blanks so sunshine is, is doing what any capitalist would do they're selling them to a higher bidder everyone wants it and and selling it at spot or near spot is a dumb deal for sunshine if they can sell it <laughs> much more to everybody else but the disconnection and all of this comes in, we get a, a phone call as one of the 27 U.S. Mint authorized resellers. We get a call from the U.S. Mint in June, late June of this year saying, yeah, by the way, we're going to um, curtail gold production by 50 percent into the second half of the year. Now, what? Why the hell would you guys do that if no one's been buying any gold for the past two and a half years, just silver? So either they're having the same problem with gold, which I don't believe because, you know, one ounce gold bars cost me the same today than they did five years ago. Uh, Maple Leafs are just a little bit higher gold than they were five years ago. But the gold eagles, my cost on gold eagles is between 10 and 11 percent over the price of gold before I make a penny. I've never sold them to the public my whole career above 6 percent ever. Mm -hmm. And now I'm buying them for north of 10 and they're impossible to get. So something is really weird with the. The U.S. men, and I guess there's a fine line, Rob, and you guys between conspiracy and reality. I don't know what the answer is other than to say if it were just the Silver Eagles, I'd buy the argument. Now that gold is into this shortage problem with the U.S. men, I throw up my hand and say, I don't know. Is it something much bigger than that? Are they trying to mitigate a run on the dollar? Are they trying to make it more difficult for people in this country to accumulate gold and silver legal tender of the United States and flee the dollar? or the, the, the related, the potential problems that we see coming, or is it something just as simple as a lack of supply? I don't know, but I will tell you of all of the major mints of the world, they are by far the worst, uh, the, the least amount of efficiency and the worst performing in terms of getting product into the public's hands, by far, not even close. Go ahead, Dave. <laughs> so Andy, I've got a couple questions here. Um, it, you you mentioned that would it require an act of Congress to enable the mint to raise the price it pays for blanks? 
I don't know if it's an act of Congress, but it's it, Janet Yellen would have to sign off on it. The Treasury Secretary has to sign off on it. I don't know what goes into so there's, there's bylaws into the, governing the mint in terms of what they can pay in relation to spot for silver. Bonds. I do believe so. Yes, I do believe that. Okay. Is the case. Well, it, it seems like for the most part, the U.S. Mint's the only mint having this issue because right now you can sell me a one ounce silver maple leaf for almost two bucks below what you're willing to pay me for a silver eagle yeah so and that, that, that that's case. true i i, I, I really I, it, it makes it makes zero sense and, and to make things even more complex is that the sunshine refinery who provides the planchets or the blanks to the u.s men also provides the blanks to the other sovereign men like south africa and a few of the others so while they have no problem delivering product to the other sovereign mints. The U.S. is sitting there saying, for whatever reason, yeah, we've ramped up supply. They're making like 80, 85,000 of them a month when they've proven in 08 and 09 and back when, you know, they were making 50 million a year that they can make four mm -hmm. to five million of them a month instead of 70, 80, 90,000. They are woefully behind the curve in terms of demand meeting supply um it, it's just a mystery i mean people have been asking me this question for two years now and i throw up my hands and say it's just it's just a total and complete mystery you would think that if if there was that much demand for the silver eagle product that the u.s mint would or that the treasury would pay more in the open market if they're going to get it on the back end i don't understand it and it's it this is why you have people who walk that line of conspiracy and reality what is the truth it just doesn't make sense yeah and i think to to throw in some just some extra thoughts for people to ponder and, and potentially argue um it seems as though we worked on a particular type of system now that the market has shifted from a physical perspective and the flows have changed i mean flows west to east out of the comex uh I think Ian last year at Silver Symposium, my friend was talking about and asked one of the panelists at one of the the the, um, the panels asked why are the uh, the essentially the refiners going to Comex to get silver because he can't get it from the miners. So maybe we're just living in a different world in which shortages along the supply chain have caused everybody to say. Well, we have two things. You have the physical shortages and you have the difference between the physical and the derivative market. Maybe everybody's protecting their their margins and protecting their business by saying, for example, if, if, if we're selling to the mint and they're not giving us preferred pricing, I can go out here and get it in the market. Why wouldn't I go out to the market and just not give them? You know, maybe it has to do with certain entities along the supply chain not adjusting to, you know, the pricing signals. Do you think that that could be a part of it? Or do you think there's something else going on to where the American Mint has the U.S. Mint has basically just said we no longer have that you know prerogative to supply the American eagle. We don't care about it anymore. Is it more they're looking at it as an artifact of an old system, or do you think it's still supply chain stuff that's causing some of these issues? And I'll open that up to anybody who wants to talk about it. I have a hard time believing it's it's really the supply chain issues. I mean, the supply chain is distorted for sure, uh, and it's fractured, and it sucks. Um, and I can read you a list as after this of I had my operations a week or two ago provide this to me so I could so I could talk about it on podcasts of all the refineries throughout the world who aren't taking any new business or, or just don't have the capacity. But they've been the only one that who's been like this since 2020. And it's been three years of it. It's something to me. Um, I don't know that it, that they look at it as an artifact of of you know bygone uh, times, but um, there it, it's the behavior is is wholly unusual. And um, when it's easier to get South African Krugerrands or uh, Austrian Philharmonics than it is U.S. Eagles for the public, something is really wrong. And and now the fact that they're doing it with gold it is what opens. I think the door to this being something much bigger than just what we are being told, because with gold, they don't have the same restrictions that they do with silver. They can go out into the open market anywhere and buy gold and, and buying a, a gold good delivery bar is not going to carry the type of premiums that you see in, um, 
in, in silver. So I, I just, uh, I don't know, you guys. I, I at one other point, and that is I asked Keith Newmeyer once about the fact, why don't you guys just all withhold like you do? Why don't the other miners? And he more or less said that these miners, many of them are living hand to mouth and they have a good deal. When they pull the, the dory out of the ground, they call someone like JP Morgan or Goldman Sachs and they say, here's where you deliver it to. The money will be in your account in an hour. And so, you know, they send it off to a refiner somewhere on behalf of the bank and they get paid like that. They don't have the ability or the wherewithal to hold back production or to disintermediate the bullion banks. They're, they don't have deep enough pockets. Maybe that will happen someday. Don't know. But there are very few mining companies like First Majestic and Keith who who have this vision. Most of them are just trying to get paid and pull the metal out of the ground and, and keep on going. So I don't know, it's a good question, but it's a tough one to answer. Yeah, I, one thought there, I, I do think, cause I do do a lot of the boots on the ground minor stuff and I've talked to hundreds of CEOs as many of us have, cause you cover this sector I and mean, you're gonna run into mining companies or what produce what we like to buy. And they're a vital part of the supply chain. And they right now, it's been 11 years since they've had decent investment into the mining sector. I'm looking at like junior miners that follow Kai Hoffman's research at SOAR Financial. It's been 11 years since they've had a robust amount of money going into mining, whether it be precious metals or base metals or anybody. And so a lot of that junior production that I think is so key to the market and that exploration hasn't been going on. And they are living hand to mouth. These guys don't have money to promote their own companies. And so I'm doing as much free promotion as I can right now to companies just to get them out there because the sector desperately needs dollars. It needs dollars. There's risk in the sector, yes, but there's reward as well. And that old system of rewarding risk-taking and building companies seems to be broken because the money's not coming in. And in an environment at which the broad market is selling off, people are hunting for return, you've got this, what I guess by conventional measures is an undervalued mining sector that's not getting the dollars. I understand why the miners you know, may protect their assets and, and why they may sell. They're... they're forgive forgive the term but the, you know the market hasn't by the balls these guys don't have a choice to go out of business and if a lot of mines go out of business or they go on maintenance where's the next you know batch coming from there's a complete disconnect between the signals in the market telling people where to put their money and where the need is and where the money's actually going and I, to me that's a byproduct of this garbage fiat monetary system which is misallocated capital away from critical sectors that's my thought i don't know chris uh what, what's your thought? You cover this, you know, at, uh, you know, gold seek, silver seek. What are your thoughts on, you know, the mining sector? How are these guys doing? Is it affecting supply? Is it part of this conversation we're having about the bullion? Well, yeah, there hasn't been, uh, you know, enough uh, investment in exploration for quite a while. And a big reason for that is if you look at the actual free cash flow of gold and silver producers, it's, it's razor thin. Even though we've, we've seen gold prices, you know, go up a lot and come back, they had a short period of high profitability, but now costs have been soaring at most every company. I mean, I, I think Newmont reported, they're usually relatively low cost. They reported in Q3 all in sustaining costs of almost $1,300 an ounce. Mm. So even when you know the gold price is up significantly from you know 2018 you know uh, this cost inflation has really uh, put a damper on excess profits and then the same and even more so in the silver sector um, you know we're back down to what twenty dollars an ounce and the average all in sustaining cost is probably higher than that so you know that's not a recipe for uh, more exploration, big discoveries. And um, yeah, you know, I attribute it to, you know, there's obviously manipulation, but um, you're right. The market kind of has them by the balls and, you know, it's the lowest cost producers that can invest the most. And they're the only ones capable of hold, holding any um, gold and silver back. And even in that case, they can't hold back that much especially with these new uh, mining laws in uh, Latin America, royalties are going up significantly. Um, they're bas basically stealing you know, the wealth from these miners, 
even though the margins aren't, aren't really there anymore. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we need a period of, you know, excess profits, which I think is long overdue, and maybe we'll start to get some investment and exploration. And But, you know, long-term, that bodes well for the prices of these metals, copper, gold, silver, everything, because, you know, these are these assets deplete and you need to uh, find more. And, you know, that's not happening right now. Yeah, and on top of that, you also have the mine supply has been falling for five years. So it's not as if there was a big increase in production. And then you add conditions that Chris just mentioned on top of it. And certainly at this price, not incentivizing new projects to go online and makes you wonder how this is going to play out going forward, especially with administrations wanting everything to go green and, and wild numbers of uh, the, the increase in solar panels and, and the other uses. So makes you wonder where that silver is going to come from. And I get it that it might not be happening today, but certainly sets up a bit of a cliff going <clears throat> forward. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add, I, you know, when I first thought about the idea of, of mining companies holding back production to try and, you know, throw hand grenades at the manipulators. You know, I thought, wow, what a great idea. But after talking to the CEO of Fortuna about it, I mean, first of all, that's not their business. They're, they're not investment funds. They're they're mining companies. It's capital intensive, as, as uh, the other Chris pointed out. And their job is to pull the silver out of the ground as cheaply as possible and get the best possible price for it. And they have to keep the cash flow coming in. And and the other, you know, I, I think it's kind of turned into kind of a gimmick idea, if anything, um, just to get attention. Because, it, first of all, primary silver producers only produce 30% of the silver that's actually produced globally. That's the big These point. Giant mining conglomerates produce 70% of the silver as a byproduct of the other metals that they produce. So even that's if every primary one. silver producer took one quarter and held back silver... Maybe it'll have a short-term effect on the price. I don't know, but it's not something that's sustainable. So, I mean, my, my feeling on the whole thing is that eventually, and I, you know, who the hell knows when, eventually the market will enforce the laws of supply and demand on the actual price of physical metal. And it may take a, a massive blow up in COMEX futures for that to happen. I, I don't know. I don't know what will trigger it. But eventually the market will will, you know, be the deciding factor on where the price of silver goes. I mean, you know, we're seeing that happen this week with the cryptocurrencies. I mean, anyone who looked at them honestly knew that eventually that it was it was a Ponzi scheme that was going to implode. And that's what we're seeing right now. But, you know, it it took the market itself to actually enforce that discipline on the pricing. Yeah, and it it seems as though a couple, a couple of points here for you guys to ponder. It seems as though when we look at silver in particular, it's it's one of the just most unloved markets right now, but yet one of the most, it, it drives me crazy. It This bedevils me. It's one of the most needed minerals on earth, and it's one of the most underappreciated and uncared for markets on earth from start to finish, from the mining piece of it to people putting in their investment portfolio. I, I think when people are looking at the economic situation around the world and all the geopolitical stuff, you know, why would you ever, uh, why, why would you purchase cash over silver? Why would you go bonds over silver? Why would you go back into to declining stocks with, with historically high PE ratios over silver? Why isn't that message of silver out? I know it's a tiny market, but what, where's, where in the communication of the messaging to investors and enthusiasts, where is that broken for silver? I mean, you look at the dynamics of it, and it looks to me like a classic, uh, well, there's going to be a classic boom when it comes, and, and the boom's going to be stupid ridiculous because all the factors at the same time are aligning you know, to where silver price has to go up. There's, there's nothing that I can see where anybody, even if you dump paper on the COMEX, is going to be able to stop it. When, once there's whispers of a supply shortage, that thing goes vertical. 
I don't, I don't give a crap what the bullion banks do. Okay. This is where you push the bullion banks aside and you say, Mr. Market's going to take over, you know, screw the bullion banks at that point. And it seems as though the fundamentals are already aligned for people to notice that. Why aren't people, why aren't there smart people jumping in? Why don't we hear about people, you know, taking strategic positions in some of these mining companies, taking strategic positions in the silver market? Why in the hell has have people not noticed silver? Is it all what's going on in the media and the screaming meter and people aren't paying attention? But where is that signal to the market for people to come in and say that this, I mean, it's a no brainer. You look at, you look at the market, it's a no brainer. Where, where are the people? I can answer that. I can attempt. I can tell you that it is expanding and the order sizes that we're doing are exponentially larger. But give you a good example. I moved down to Southern Florida. I live in a golf community. I play golf with a bunch of guys, many of which are financial advisors, and every one of them say the same damn thing. Well, with inflation where it is right now and the world is crazy, it is why the hell would anyone buy gold and silver? It hasn't done anything. Mm -hmm. The price suppression is the ultimate tool of misdirection. And if if value and demand was reflected in price, then who the hell is bleeding dry the largest supply centers on the planet? Why mm -hmm. are we seeing a, a bleed down out of COMEX, a bleed down out of, of deliveries off of SLD? And why are we seeing uh, the LME at its lowest stockpile in the history of, of since they started keeping records in 2016? Who is draining the largest stockpiles of gold and silver in the world using price as a tool of misdirection, where in one day, 45% of the kilo bars on the COMEX gold, 25 million ounces gone. In one day last week, 5% or 4% of all the 100 ounce bars gone in one day, where it seems every day we see a million ounces delivered out of SLV by the authorized participants. And you know, a country like India delivering in the month of August or September more than there is in the registered category. So what you're seeing is the smart money using price to quietly accumulate it and sneak out back door left. But the people who think they're smart in this country, the financial advisors who have skated to a wonderful career over the past 20 years by doing nothing other than just riding the, the, the wave, well, they think we're crazy because price has not um, synced up yet with fundamentals. And, you know, they think of hell, if it isn't going to do it now, then it never will. And I understand that. I can understand where if you really didn't immerse yourself in what's truly happening in this industry and the manipulation on COMEX and the suppression and JP Morgan and all of the things in the Bart Chilton interview that Chris did and all of these things that we get and are screaming like, are you guys stupid? The mainstream doesn't get it yet. It's starting to a little bit, but by and large, the people who think they're smart, the financial advisors, that they just don't get it. Yeah, there's example of people in the industry that watch the industry who who are not super bullish silver, like Lobo Tigre had on my program. And to be fair, he came on and said, I'm the Darth Vader for silver guy. So he's labeled himself as the, you know, sort of the antithesis of the silver movement. And he says the exact argument you just talked about, Andy, is like the price hasn't moved, so why do I care? Now, he's a right. smart guy. He understands how to watch the fundamentals. He understands the market. He gets it. But even as somebody who gets it, he's like, if the price doesn't move, I don't care. To me, that's a bit defeatist because the price should be moving and we should talk about why it's not. But if people who are in the sector have that opinion, I guess it's hard to generate excitement outside the sector you know, the enthusiasts and the, and the market analysts need to sort of lead that. And I do, as a partial criticism of our industry, I do think that there are severe challenges in messaging in the precious metal space, uh, up and down, you know, the supply chain. And it's, it's something that just drives me a little bit bonkers uh, because it, it doesn't make sense that such vital assets to the, to the economy, especially silver or just ignored that the, the way that they are and even people within the precious metals industry maybe whiplash from their subscribers for having talked about silver and it never moves you know have the bullion banks just defeated us all and just taken away our will i'm going to ask uh, chris marcus this question what and you and i've talked about this a lot you know i was down in mexico and had conversations about it what's what's your thought on silver now i know you've gone back and reevaluated some of your thoughts on it you know, as we've sat through this extended sideways period, are you, Crystal, super bullish on silver or are you considering some of the arguments against it? 
Well, I get what, what you're saying about how people are frustrated because the price has gone down. And Andy, mm -hmm. I know you've heard the calls for years where people are invested in silver and they, they eventually throw in the towel because they see the NASDAQ and the stock market's going up. So I think at the same time, you've seen Bitcoin going up. So people are chasing returns and perhaps understandably so. I think maybe part of the tricky part with silver is that it requires a longer term horizon and really digging in and understanding some of the things that you were mentioning where, you know, you look at all of the different pieces fitting together, the, the demand for physical silver that's going on, the profile of what's coming out of the supply side and seeing that at some point there's, there's an issue here. And if you factor in, uh, more overt troubles or more overt breakage from what the fed is doing, which, we're starting to see now, Dave reports on the housing market, how that's, you know, getting increasingly clobbered. Um, the stock markets are now down. And I think that environment, you know, it, it changes when it does. And that's hard for a lot of people to accept if you're concerned about the Fed, which not everybody in the planet is. I mean, I think it takes a little bit of a different profile for people who are digging into Austrian economics studying what happened with the housing bubble, why when you print money, things look great. When you take the money away, you have a problem. And I think that's hard for a lot of people to really extend that further out. And certainly, you know, the, the goal of an investment advisor is to make money and how do you protect against those black swans? But that's where silver and gold come in. And, you know, it doesn't need to necessarily be the entire portfolio for someone, but when you look at these issues that are coming out and seeing what's happening now as the Fed's raising interest rates, and it's not as if it's going particularly well. I know the government's saying don't call it a recession and everything's fine out there, yet now Janet Yellen's coming out uh, talking about you know reshifting the allocation of treasuries because lack of liquidity in the treasury market, which shouldn't be entirely surprising when the largest buyer steps away that you're going to have issues like that. So... I think there's some balance of what's happening in the short term and having a plan for that, but also being prepared for some of these things that are unraveling. I don't, I don't know when we hit the gap of when there's no silver left, but you look at where we are today and the factors that are stacking up, it's, it's not going well. And when you have supply meet demand, as these trends continue going forward, then that's how I look at it these days. Certainly mm -hmm. the fact that, you know, you have inflation up and I mean, gold is still not all that far off from its all time highs yet. Silver down around 20, $21, you know, it's still a ways off of $50 that it sold in uh, 1980 and 2011. So I think these are some of the factors that make it difficult for people. And I can understand if someone doesn't want to wait that long and maybe having a, the right expectation, but Certainly, if you see issues going forward, you see central bank digital currencies about to get unrolled. Um, I think that's where silver still comes in handy and will have its day. Adding on to what Chris said and to answer your question, Rob, I mean, if you understand the monetary metals, the importance of owning some as insurance, all fiat uh, empires fail. They always have. They always mm -hmm. will. It's the inherent nature of government to abuse, especially democracy, uh, to try to fulfill their needs. They do not care about their the long-term consequences. That's why, you know, there's a common characteristics, characteristic of uh, currency crises that's, they're built on mountains of debt and they eventually um, collapse due to inflation or theoretically, just a lot loss of uh, um, belief in the currency could cause that. So I think, you know, if you understand that you have to be bullish a long term and, you know, the long term isn't so, looking so long anymore. You look at, you know, the financial positions of all the major governments around the world, it is just ludicrous. I don't know how people aren't more outraged at what's going on, how they're spending money. Chris, I, yeah, that's what I don't understand. When I was growing up and we watched media, even though I wasn't a financial guy growing up, obviously, um, you, 
there seemed to be a rationality to how people talked about the financial markets, but there doesn't seem to be, particularly for the last seven, eight years, any rationality in talking about this market and talking about the debt and talking about stock market valuations and bond rates. It's almost as if the world has just decided none of it matters. And I used to write for Seeking Alpha and Seeking Alpha is a good sentiment indicator. There's so much there that you can kind of feel when you're there every day, how people feel about stuff going through the, the, the content. And I noticed a change nine or 10 years ago where people stopped looking at fundamentals. They stopped caring about things they used to care about. Um, what's your thought on that? Have we gotten away from fundamentals and, and are we going to return to that? And is there going to be any sort of sanity in financial markets or is it going to be just crazy like this where everything gets tossed on a head? None of the old models work. Nobody knows what's going on. We're in confusion. Is that a transition period until we get into some resolution, do you think? Or I think there has to be a, a reset or a collapse for for fundamentals to matter again because mm -hmm. you know people don't understand how important interest rates are, what they they signal to market participants, you know, society's time preference. When you distort that, that causes misallocations of capital and whatnot. Because of the massive debt burdens of all the major governments. They can't let the um, interest rates go to you know what the Austrians call the natural rate, where you know supply meets demand, where that interest rate would be. Mm -hmm. Instead, yeah, they're raising rates now, but they're just we're going to pivot next year. I mean, there's no argument against that. And you know, it, I'm actually surprised we can handle rates this high for mm -hmm. this long. And I don't think we will. It does take time to for it's, that to work its it way. It's been that long, dude. <laughs> well, I mean, given how leveraged we are, I, I, I'm surprised that you know the tenure's been this high without something happening already. Yeah, the last time we went through papered high, over behind the scenes up, up to this point. Yeah. yeah, the the last time we went through high interest rate, it went for years. It didn't go for just months. I wonder if we're in a, a period of time in which interest rates are going to take years to work out. I mean. Well, the the debt issue has to be resolved, otherwise we can't have normal normalized interest rates. And you know, it's funny how these PhD economists, I mean, if you can call them economists, think that there's a way out of this in the long term. And you know, as you know, and low interest rates that deters savings, so that deters capital formation, which forms the basis of real growth. We don't have that, and we won't until you know something changes. So, so Rob, it's not just the last eight or nine years where fundamentals have been thrown out the window. I mean, this this country has gone through periods throughout history where markets don't care about fundamentals. Look at the Roaring Twenties, for instance. True, sure. but the difference between then and now is that the world was on a gold standard. And the U.S. fixed its treasury problem by revaluing the price of gold by 75 percent, right? And and that that basically replenished, you know, the U.S. reserves and 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 you know addressed deficits and and debt buildup. Fundamentals have gone out the window completely since 1971, and it's just been, you know, it, it comes and goes in waves, <clears throat> right? I mean, we've had. We've had market several market bubbles since 1971. I mean, look at the look at the internet bubble. There, were, trust me, I was trading that market actively back then. There were no fundamentals back then, and and same thing, you know, really from like 2003 to 2008, same type of thing. It's just the bubble that we have now is multiples of any other bubble that we've seen in the history of our financial markets. So, you know, I I agree with with Chris. I was going to say Chris M, but I guess it's Chris Marchese. I have to say, <laughs> I I agree with Chris there. You know, and you know this that there's there's going to have to be some type of reset. And, and you know, um, I was just going to say, you know, as opposed to the 20s and other periods of manias and bubbles, this is a structural problem, and it's global, the Western world. Yeah. You know, this that wasn't the case. We didn't have these mountains and mountains of debt. These trillions and trillions of unfunded liabilities it's just a completely different ball game now and you know we're in the last innings of you know the life of the the 
fiat dollar. And, and layer in the derivatives also. Yeah. I mean, they didn't they they didn't get rid of derivatives in 2008 and 2000. Graham Dodd didn't get rid of derivatives. It just erased the the necessity to to report them the way they should be reported. So they're still there. They're just off balance sheet, and the problem's even bigger now than it was in 2008. <clears throat> well, I think one difference that you have now is that finally there's a, a large and growing group of nations that seem to be a bit tired of it and are actively yeah. on a daily basis discussing plans to de-dollarize. We saw what happened with Russia earlier this year. Now Saudi mm -hmm. Arabia is talking about joining the BRICS, and that's something that didn't exist, uh, at least to this degree, back 10 or even tw or 20 years ago. So I think part of the problem is that right now it's like, all right, if we if some countries don't like the dollar, what do you switch to? And maybe that's not out there yet. But the fact that there's a growing list of nations that are investing a lot of time and money into figuring that out and really that you saw other countries stand up to the U.S. this year with what you saw in Russia and Ukraine and different places in the Middle East, I think, is one of the big differences going forward. No question, 100%. It is the biggest issue. And now you've got um, Saudi Arabia, who a week ago or 10 days ago announced that they are joining BRICS and confirmed by the Royal Crown Prince and by the president of South Africa. You got uh, Xi Jinping going to Saudi Arabia to, I believe, to ink the deal, to welcome them in to uh, to the BRICS nations with open arms. You have China come out, or Saudi Arabia come out and publicly say last week that China is their biggest priority in oil and gas this year and for the next 50 years. They just came out and publicly said this. They basically just said, fuck you to the US. And, it's, and in fact, they said that the only thing they view the U.S. for right now is protection. And here you've got these two brain dead senators because they are not pumping more oil into the midterms, looked at it as an open act of aggression and have proposed a bill to remove the uh, Patriot missiles from the United Arab Emirates and from Saudi Arabia. In essence, removing the protection, that is what has given the dollar the world reserve status since 1974, the protection of the Saudi yeah. kingdom. And when you talk about the Belt Road Initiative that all these countries are part of, along with the BRICS nations, all 13 OPEC producing countries are on the Belt Road. Saudi's joining the BRICS. Half of these countries on, on, on these OPEC producing countries, there's 13 of them. Six of them are already on BRICS or going to be on BRICS. The seventh, the United Arab Emirates, just joined the BRICS banks. They're all moving against the West. And um, they just had last week, they just finished a 40-day trial of their new Embridge system, which is a cross-border payment system for uh, central bank digital currencies. And what do you know? It removes or sidesteps the, the, the uh, U.S. intermediate banks. In other words, it is no longer part of the SWIFT system. When we weaponize the dollar and push Russia out of SWIFT, that was the incentive for all these countries to say, you know what, this ain't going to happen to us. And so this has just been finalized. And I would I would say, you know, look, I mean, is this the beginning of the new BRICS reserve currency that they told us is going to be released this year, or early next, pegged to a basket of commodities? And so when you put it all together, when you see like a country like Turkey, who said, we're going to join BRICS too, they bought more gold the first seven months of the year than any country on the planet. Why do you think? because they all want a seat at the table. You see what's happening is this hypocrisy and this bullying by the West, this hegemony that we have is what is bringing everyone to the table to stand up against the West. But what will make it work, the glue, will be the pegging using a distributed ledger technology, using the digital yuan, which has been going on for four years now, uh, successful beta testing of it, call it, even at the Winter Olympics in Beijing, they used just the digital yuan. It's going to be the rails by which they show the pegging of all of these countries that are going to peg their commodities to the new BRICS currency, which has been told by the finance minister of Russia, will be pegged to commodities, not just a basket of local currencies. You put it all together, that what Chris just said is the biggest deal of them all. And that's going to happen. And 
in and of themselves, even a decade ago, none of these countries could stand up to the West. And since Bretton Woods in 1944, the whole world has been flooded with dollars. So it just made sense when we went to a fiat system to stick with dollars because they were everywhere. But I'll tell you something, the days are coming to an end. All of these deals that are being struck are saying, fuck you to the dollar. Every single one of them that are being struck, they are pushing the dollar away. And when all of these countries come together, you have a stronger military, a much bigger economy, and a combined hatred and mistrust of the Western system that is the rallying cry, but the glue will be the gold backing and the commodity backing for all the world to see pegged on a distributed ledger for everyone to see the immutability and the veracity of it. It's coming. And so what's going on at the Fed and the raising the rates, and it's a sideshow. All it will take would be for Saudi Arabia to say, you know what, thanks, it's been a good ride. But us and all 13 of our, our, our BRIC, I mean, of our OPEC producing brothers and sisters on the Belt Road, most of us are joining BRICS. Probably all of us are going to join BRICS. We're opening up oil sales to the new BRICS currency and maybe some others. And bang, like that, the dollar collapses. And they all come rushing home, creating hyperinflation. And if you think they're not going to raise rates and they're going to pivot, yeah. But the villain in all of this is them, the, the BRICS and the the interest rates spike to the moon in the face of massive hyperinflation because everyone's dumping dollars that's had to hold them since 1974 to buy oil, which is now flip-flopped. The day we left Afghanistan and Russia and Saudi Arabia signed that deal, it was the end of the petrodollar. And now you're beginning to see it spin in terms of how it's all coalescing. And when that happens, that is the reason I believe, much like this right here, when FDR told all his buddies, we're going to confiscate gold. Well, why did all the gold end up in the safe deposit boxes in Europe? As he told all his buddies, get it, get it the hell out of the country before we confiscate it. I'm real good friends with the largest importer down here in Florida in all of the world of U.S. $20 gold pieces that come from safe deposit boxes of European banks where they've been there since the end of World War II or since 1933, rather. It's the same thing. The people that are draining COMEX and the LME, they know what's coming. They see what's coming. They're clued into what's coming. They're getting out of the ecosystem. They're pulling their stuff out and running for the hills for the safety of, of, of uh, and removal of counterparty risk of being outside the system. And when that switch is flipped, like Chris said, the BRICS system, bang, like that, it's over. Interest rates spike and stocks, bonds, and real estate and the dollar all collapse simultaneously. There's your Klaus Schwab moment. There's your great reset. There are your villains. We didn't do it. They did it to us. And then you start over and, and with a new gold backed currency, maybe just like the BRICS are going to do. How else do you get a reset without falling on the sword? You do it by incentivizing the world to find an alternative to the dollar and it's coming. And I, I think that's the most important takeaway that I would take from anything that's happening around the globe right now is everyone's moving against the West. Yeah, I think that incentivizing was actually done by the West to incentivize yeah. everybody to see us as a bully. And yes. I think people just get tired of us being the bully at the schoolyard, taking everybody's lunch money and they decide to gang up on us. And that's the funny thing about tyrants. Once everybody turns on you, the tyrant has no power and he becomes the one running from it all. And how many times have we seen that in history? It's just stunning, I think, Andy, to see the United States in the position of being the tyrant from its dollar position. And that's not me. Some people will interpret that in its current context in criticizing the current administration or the Fed or Powell or whoever, the Treasury. When I look at that, I look at that from a centuries-long perspective. You see this in every nation state. They get hubris. They think that they own the world. They use their currency as a weapon. They use the military as a weapon. And, and I had a buddy in the Navy years ago tell me, nobody will ever stand up to us because we have a better Navy. And he said, China has a green water Navy, not a blue water. They can't come get us. And I looked at him and said, when the financial system collapses, they don't need to come get us. They don't need to build this military machine to combat us. If we can't pay our troops, look what happened in Rome. Look what happened, you know, all of these other places. So if people are from a financial and a <clears throat> political standpoint, just simply realigning away from the dollar, isn't this on a global scale, Ayn Rand's uh, you know, book about just exiting the system? Isn't it just the rest of the world saying uh, we're, we're done with this system and it's Atlas Shrugged, but on a global scale? And perhaps 
where I'm getting to as an American, if you don't trust your institutions anymore, maybe it's time to look outside those institutions to protect yourself. And I think that's personally where I'm at. I have just absolutely been stunned over the last few years over all the institutions that in my eyes have fallen away, uh, how quickly they've fallen away and how quickly we see a thin veneer of, of what they were and what they are now. And I'm at the point where I look at the United States and I say, that's a paper tiger now. And it hurts me to say it, you know, I grew up here and my, my father fought World War II, you know, on D-Day to, to protect freedoms, not only for the U.S., but the world. And so my family and, and many, and my mother grew up during the Great Depression, my family, in many respects, you know, lived through the tough times and, and were patriots. But I'm looking at the country I see now. It's not the country that my father fought for. And it's almost like you almost have to make a choice. Do you stick with American institutions and trust American media and American politicians or do you say, I, it's now time for me to make the same choice the rest of the world is making and protect myself? Maybe that's a rhetorical question. Maybe nobody wants to answer that here. Maybe that's something we can talk about at Silverfest. I think we're seeing this change of thought around the world. Do Americans need to start doing this? Do they need to de-dollarize their own personal balance sheets? And I know we only have a few minutes left, but if anybody wants to take a stab at that one. I just think you're, you're one of the few people who speaks so eloquently and also very um, balanced about the way we talk. I get a little emotional about all this mm -hmm. because I see it so clearly. You have a very balanced analytical viewpoint. And the answer is yes, you, you have to save yourself and your family first. You have to, if you believe in these things, you have to do what the smart money is doing and remove counterparty risk and de-dollarize. And it's a noble effort to try to save people. But it's funny, the people we talk to on a computer screen are more likely to listen to us than the people we love and care about Mm -hmm. Here has been my my uh, my own uh, uh, experience, but anyways, the bottom line is I couldn't agree with everything you said. Even, I mean, perfectly, explicitly, you said, it, and I think that's where we are right now. Where uh, not only has the U.S. incentivized us to find the bully, I look at them, and I think most of the world looks at us right now as a paper tiger. And you can't stand up to the bully, but when the whole schoolyard is behind you going after the bully and you're all together with baseball bats makes it a whole lot easier. I know that we're <clears throat> running out of time. I know we're all busy. Thank you everybody for joining the program. I'm just going to screen share real quick. And we're going to talk a little bit about Silverfest. Chris, you're up on this one. Tell us what's going on in Silverfest, why people want to sign up and uh, how cool this one's going to be. I know I've been the, the past two, it's just been a lot of fun. You throw really fun, engaging conferences that people can feel like they can be a part of. So tell us what you've got on uh, in store for Silverfest 3. Well, really just digging into a lot of the things that we've been talking about today. Uh, we have a bunch of guests, celebrities. Uh, there's David Morgan, who will be giving the Silver Year in review. And like, like we've talked about, it's not easy for a lot of people to see. And there's not a lot of people who are looking at these things. But that's the whole point of having Silverfest, to bring people together where you have a chance to ask questions, Excited to see Ronan Manley, uh, who's done some great research, especially on the COMEX and LBMA vaults. I know he doesn't do as much interviews, but we're really excited to have him on board. Rafi Farber is going to be there. And just digging into all the uh, different elements, we've seen a lot of SLV shorting, COMEX going into backwardation, Alistair McLeod and Rafi going to talk about the Fed and how much more they can raise rates, whether even raising rates will have an impact on inflation. And then we have a couple of silver miners who are going to give their perspective, certainly on the supply side. And as you can see, we have the silver stock round table and ask the experts, uh, Dave and Rob going to be there, Bill Murphy as well, Craig Hemke going to be joining us for that one too. And then just uh, having a place to get together where we can talk and hang out and you can bring your beer or glass of wine to the Silverfest happy hour. But the whole point is just to give people a place to come together, talk, hear the different topics and the experts who study this day in, day out and get a better handle on some of the solutions and why we talk so much about silver and where all this is headed. So look forward to seeing people on Saturday. And thank you again, Rob, for putting this call together. It's great to be here with all of you and Look forward to seeing you all on Saturday as well. Yeah, I look forward to it as well. Any closing comments from anybody else on Silverfest or anything we talked about today? I guess we have a couple more minutes for at the log off. I'll save my comments for Silverfest. 
<laughs> Ooh, Dave with the tease. <laughs> What's yeah, he gonna bring? Gonna to, uh, He's gonna drop a bomb at Silver to get Press. Take there. <laughs> I'm gonna have to call in and and participate as much as I can. My son moved to New York City uh, about five months ago. I haven't even visited him yet, so uh, we've had a trip planned this weekend, unfortunately. So I'm gonna call in and take part in as many things as you'll have me take part in, and as much as I can. Um, I'm I'm very sad that I won't be able to participate the way I have the last few years, but I will be there as much as I can then, of course, in spirit. And the later you go, the more I'll, I'll be able to be there. Well, we'll look forward to having you. And thanks again for everyone who's going to be a part of it, as well as people watching and attending, because uh, it's for you and to help answer questions and make this journey a little easier as we navigate through the silver world. Perfect, guys. Thank you so much, Andy, Dave, Chris, and Chris. Appreciate you being on the program again. Always an honor to have you guys on the program. A lot thanks, of respect. Everyone. So you guys. for you guys. Oh, See yeah, everybody at Saturday. Silver Fest. Yes, yeah, Saturday, Silverfest. Mm -hmm. Clear your schedules. Forget college football. That stuff's not important. Come watch Silverfest. We'll be there. <laughs> oh, I'll have it on in the background. <laughs> Bye, guys. Everyone take care. See ya.